So I'm, a, I'm an educational psychologist. I currently work in a place called Wirral, which is just across the Mersey from Liverpool. And I have a, a patch of schools that I work in there, and I supervise a team of psychologists. And I also work one day a week in a school, a residential school for children with extreme challenging behaviour, uh, where we work on well-being programmes and, and developing skills for life. One of the things that I've been trying to do today, one of my weaknesses and areas that I'm not comfortable with, is uh, technology. And lots of the talks have been about technology. And is anyone else here who's kind of a bit of a, a Luddite about not very good? Yeah, so it scares me. I used to feel really bad. And then I was lucky enough to meet uh, a person a lot of you will have heard of, Edward de Bono. Now, what used to happen up until quite recently when I was doing presentations, I would walk in with an overhead projector. Do you, do you have those in every other country where you yeah. came in with your big file and you put one at a time, put things down? And I used to feel really embarrassed about doing that. And uh, I met Edward de Bono and he told me this story. He was invited by IBM to go to New York and give a talk. And they were inviting all of their top senior people from all over the world for a few days. Rather like this, a conference in New York. So people from Australia, people from Asia, people from South America, all into New York. And he was... Um, he was the third person to speak, and he said the first two people, the first two presenters, had the most wonderful presentations. They were using all the latest technology, the lights and music and flashing things, it was fantastic. And then it was his turn to speak, and he wheeled on his overhead projector. <laughs> <laughs> and he came on with this little thing. And he did this, though. On his overhead projector, he had a cup facing the wrong way. And he said to people, he said to them, underneath this cup, I've got a cockroach. <laughs> Cucaracha. I've got a cockroach. And then on the acetate, he wrote A, B, C, D. And he said to the people, in a second, I'm going to lift this cup up. What I want you to do on your tables, I want you to bet. I want you to bet many dollars. Which letter is it going to go to first? And all around the room, people, hey, and they were all betting which one it was going to go to first. And then Edward Bernard lifted up the cup and he said, actually, there isn't a cockroach, but you couldn't have done that on PowerPoint. And I was <laughs> <laughs> going, so. The reason for, for starting with that is because I, I, I am interested in technology and I've got two teenagers who, who try to teach me all about it. Mm -hmm. But I think sometimes um, we can lose some of the fundamentals about learning and education, which are about being human. The technology helps us with the learning. And, and I suppose my, my area of interest is around well-being and mental health and, and an area called positive psychology, which is the psychology of people being the best they can be. Mm -hmm. It's the psychology of strengths. And, 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 uh, and my view, well, there's a worldwide debate at the moment around the overall purposes of education. And what a lot of people are talking about is that it's become too focused just on the academic side, just on intellectual processing, and it's missing out a whole other side, which is the social, emotional, and psychological development of children um, and young people. So what I'm going to talk about today is this concept of positive education. And positive education, in its simplest sense, is education for academic success, but at the same time, and alongside education for well-being, to prepare children for life, to play a successful and worthwhile part in their communities. So it's about looking at both those two things. It's looking at the skills and the attitudes and the beliefs and how children see themselves and young people, how they view themselves as learners, all the kind of different things they can develop. And so I'm just going to introduce you to a formula to start. Um, it's by a lady called Sonia Lyabmursky, uh, who wrote a book in the States called The How of Happiness. So the H stands for happiness. Okay, now... I was in Brazil recently, and it is early, because I asked them about, do you, are you okay with happiness? And in Brazil, everyone said, we love happiness. <laughs> we love happiness, yes, that's great. I'm from England. We, we don't like happiness. <laughs> <laughs> We're not comfortable with that term at all. It's too frivolous. It's not academic enough. So in England, we, we like to call it subjective well-being. <laughs> it's very serious, isn't it? Yeah. But actually, what we're talking about is happiness. I do a lot of work with parents and children. And um, one of the interesting things is do a lot of work about goals and outcomes. And, and what do you want in your future? What's the thing that you look for in your child more than anything? And let's build that up. And the number one answer, by a long, long way, is I want them to be happy. 
it's not frivolous at all. It's actually the reason why we do most of the things that we do. So for this formula, just, just very simply, happiness is, S stands for set point, genetic set point. So if you had 100 people, their difference in their well-being and happiness, 50% of it would be explained by genetics, by their character, by their personality. Good things happen to us, bad things happen to us, makes us feel better or worse, but then we quite quickly come back to our set point. And if you think of friends you've had for a long time, the ones who were happy-go-lucky 30 years ago, regardless of anything else, they're still kind of like that. And the ones who were miserable and always moaning and causing trouble, they're still the same in their 50s. Do you, rec do you recognize those? Yes, yeah. so, so we're about 50%. The C stands for the circumstances of our life. And that means how much money we earn, where we live, our gender, faith, age, climate, Lots of different things where most of us think success in life is and circumstances and if only I had that, etc. Accounts for about 10%, research would say. Which means that the V is about 40%. Does anyone know what the V might stand for? What might the V be in this formula? Vitality. Vit oh, that's a lovely one. Vitality would fit in there. Vitality would be in there, actually. It's not stand for that, but it would be in there. Variation. Ah, having different things. Yeah, well, actually, what it stands for are the aspects of our life that are under our voluntary control. And what that means are skills, attitudes, beliefs, that regardless of our personality and regardless of our circumstances of life, are both teachable and learnable. They're skills that are malleable. They're non-cognitive skills. They're about optimism or resilience or perseverance. They're, and what research tells us is they are both teachable and learnable at all stages of life, but some better than others. <sighs> And so that's what I want to concentrate on now. Those things that within our education systems, but also for ourselves and our families, we can learn how to have different beliefs, different attitudes and different ways of thinking. There are lots of different models around this, but the one I'd really like to introduce is one by a man called Martin Seligman, who was the founder of Positive Psychology in 1998. And it's a, it's a, a formula or, or a model that's used around the world now. And it's called PERMA. It's being used worldwide now in a number of schools, a number of institutions, and in fact in some countries to measure the well-being of their citizens. It is based on research and science. It's not just a kind of a, a, an opinion-based one. Uh, positivity, engagement, relationships, meaning, purpose, and accomplishments. So what I want to do just over the next 45 minutes or so is just talk you through some of these things. So no, no one here has come across, come across this. Okay, if you go online, there's lots and lots of information about it. There's specific information about Permarin ELT classes, etc. So we'll start with positive emotions. So we'll start with positive emotions. We know what negative emotions are there for. Yeah, negative emotions drive us to certain, certain actions. I was teaching my five-year-old son how to ride his bike without stabilizers. Okay? So the first time I'd ever taken, you know, the stabilizers? It was the first time I'd taken them off. So I took him to a field. And this field had a really gentle slope one way and a really steep slope. The other way. So I put him on the gentle one to try and have a go, but he couldn't, he couldn't pedal and steer. So I said, tell you what, I'll take you to the top of the hill. So I took him to the top of this hill. This, this field was about 200 meters wide. It was a big field. I took him to the top of the hill. At the bottom of the hill, just in the center, was a litter bin. Just one litter bin. <laughs> I didn't put him opposite that. I took him right over here. I took him to the top. Right, Joe, I'm going to the bottom of the hill. I'll see you there. And as I set off down the hill, what did I say to him? Don't hit the bin. <laughs> That's all I said to him. Make sure you don't hit the bin. That's all it took for his anxiety to kick in. <laughs> Go. Oh! <laughs> all of his focus becomes on the threat. All of his focus. So it narrows down your range of that you can't think of anything else. And if you're heading at speed down a hill, towards a litter bin on a bike, what should you do? You can't change directions because that's the only thing that exists now. You can't see the rest of the field. You're just focused on that. What should you do? Right, break. break. It's a simple thing, isn't it? And if you weren't feeling in a negative emotion or anxious, you would know that. But what happens is, as our range of thoughts comes down, so do our actions and our range of possibilities. So as he was going down to it, totally forgot about the brakes. We forget our, you know, when we're feeling bad or anxious or angry, we forget our competencies, don't we? So as he did, he did what I did as a child. He took both feet off his pedals and he went, <laughs> and smashed straight into the litter bin. 
I walked up to him, I said, Joe, you've just had an emotional hijack, son. Because I like to, <laughs> I like to teach teaching opportunities. <laughs> but, so negative emotions do that, we, we understand that. They drive certain things, fight, flight, and freeze is, is the one that we often miss. Freeze is just that, I'm gonna stay really still and hope that no one sees me. Our classrooms are full of the children. I'm just not gonna, I'm gonna keep quiet, I'm not putting my hand up. This room will be full of that if I ask you a question. <laughs> I'm not doing, I'm not doing that. Yeah? What I want to talk about though, so we know what negative do, we have to get over that, but it's positive emotions, the impact of positive emotions. I'm just gonna show you a video, I'd just like you to watch this video. It's this understanding that our perception is completely decided by the emotion that we're feeling at the time. We see the world through how we feel. We love to think we're very rational, but depending on the mood we're in, that affects. So the first one, just because the music just makes you feel a little bit on edge, it's a hostile place. It wants you to move it when you don't want to go towards it. The people there are threatening. It's hard to see the big picture and beauty. What we know now know is if you can generate a positive emotion, then actually it opens up. We see connections, we see beauty, it draws us to it. It widens what's called our thought action repertoire, it's called the broaden and build theory. It broadens our view of opportunities and things that are around, and then it builds our capacities, intellectual, social, and emotional. So the, I suppose the headline from the research is saying, not that, we used to think if I do well, then I'll feel good. If I do well in school, then I'll feel good. If, if this happens, then I'll feel good. What we now know is that's in a lot of cases the wrong way around. We should put it the other way, if I feel good, then I'm likely to do well because it will provide the energy, the motivation, the belief, etc. So generating classrooms where we have positive emotion as a starting point is really important. And it's not just a case of, of joy, which is a really important one, but it's generating lots of these other emotions. Actually focusing on how, when, when in my teaching, when in my class do we generate these emotions? Excitement. I was in a class recently of young children who were doing... Um, the passage of food through the human body, okay? It was a biology class. It was fantastic. What the teacher did, she got all the kids dressed in waterproofs, <laughs> and then she took them into the hall, okay? And they had to go through, they went through a hula hoop, you know, a big hoop, they had to crawl through the mouth, and they were the food. And they were, as they were going through, the teacher was spraying them with things, and then they were all chanting a song about where they were going. But the best thing was, at the end, at the end of this, after they'd gone through the throat and the stomach and everything, they had to climb some steps and there was another hoop and as they went through the hoop they went down a slide onto a big brown mat <laughs> in terms of excitement the kids are yes we get to be poo yeah it was fantastic do you know but every one of them knew everything that happens about food on its way through they're bringing that excitement amusement contentment i sometimes think we have a cult of personality now rather than character for some children, uh, positive emotion is not about being loud and extrovert, it's about being quiet and contemplative and thinking and being allowed to have your own space. And sometimes I think, no, you're not confident enough, you need to be... That's not, that's not what it is. Sometimes positive emotion is just being happy in your own environment and doing things. And we have to be careful of seeing that as, as children having something wrong with them because they're not joining in enough. They're joining in in the way that suits them and, and works for them. Um, interest, hope, awe. Was that stand children who had awe in your classroom? When they were just mouth open, <gasps> aghast at things. I was lucky enough uh, a few weeks ago to go to Brazil, and I went to Rio and went up to the Christ statue. 
that was just a hair on the back of my neck, just amazing, absolute awe. Oh, felt really small and insignificant and on things. When do our children, when do we do that in the classroom? There's so much wonder. They wonder about everything, don't they? But the last two are the most important, I think, to generate. First one is, is a sense of gratitude. And by that I mean just a sense of being able to notice things that are going okay, things that are going well. Because everyone in this room has what's called a negativity bias. We have a brain that is designed to give more psychological weight to things going wrong. We pay more attention to it and we add more weight to it. Do you recognize that in your own lives? Yeah? So I can do a presentation, 100 people, 99 evaluations are good, and one person says, didn't like it, rubbish. I'll be like, oh, it was terrible. Everybody hated it. <laughs> you recognize that? Yeah. You be in your classrooms, things are going wonderfully, children are learning and they're engaged and things, and then one incident happens, some child has a bit of a strop or doesn't want to do it, and then we go in the staff room and say, oh, it was no good, it didn't work. None of the children learnt anything. That child's always doing that. We just pay attention to it. We're designed to do that. I do this for a living. I spent a lot of time helping young people learn to focus on the positive. My daughter walked in and she'd just done her mock exams uh, as a 16 year old. And I said, how did you go on, darling? She said, oh, I got three A's, four B's, a C and an F. What did, what did I say to her? An F? Why do I even bother sending you to school? You don't know how oh, lazy. And she said, well, oh, Dad, I got three A's. Yes. Just shows then. If you put the effort in in your other subject, you'd be able to do better in that, wouldn't you? It's what we do. So what, one of the things about gratitude is learning to overcome our negativity bias. You have one. The children have one. And it's not, it's not positive thinking, this. It's saying good things happen, bad things happen. Where are the opportunities to pay attention to and reflect on the good things that happen on a daily basis? And we can do it in the past, in the present, or the future. Where do children get a chance to reflect on their successes? Where do they get a chance to look at things? Do, they, do you build self-belief things, or photo albums? Do they collect things about times they've had their best times in school? My daughter does a thing on my phone without telling me every so often. She just changes my screensaver on my phone <laughs> to a different photo. And I turn it on, I go, oh, and it's always a nice family memory. Or some object that she'd like me to buy her. Because <laughs> it's, it's a different thing. In the present, in the present it's about savouring. It's about just learning to be in the moment. One of the problems with technology is some children now and young people are being distanced from the experience. I don't know what it's like in, in other countries. In England now, if you go to see a concert, you can't see the stage because everyone's yes, yes. doing that. Yeah, it's, it's, when we go on holiday, I'm going on holiday in a couple of weeks to Spain, and my daughter, she'll do like last year, we'll say, should we take a family photo? No, I don't want to do that. Well, my friends see that, and she will walk about three steps away and take a selfie. No. <laughs> in the same place, but she just doesn't want, and, and we kind of miss out, don't we? Yeah, it struck home to me very, very strongly with my, when my son reached uh, 11. And prior to 11, he used to hold my hand all the time. Walking down the street, just naturally, and then he got to 11 and he became too cool to hold my hand. Do you know that? You know that feeling? I'm not holding your hand. Not your hand. <laughs> At about the age of 12, he stopped completely. But between 11 and 12, sometimes, it became very rare, he forgot that he was too cool to hold my hand. <laughs> so we'd walk down the street and he'd put, what I did for 10, 11 years, I'd ignored it, paid no attention. Just during that year, I just paid attention to everything, to how it felt, to where we were. I just savoured that moment. Do you know what I mean? I'd even sniff his head. You know that you do? You know that you do with babies? Yeah. Get off, Dad! <laughs> really embarrassing. Really embarrassing. And then it's about, and also for them, the future. Anticipation. Where do we build a sense of anticipation and excitement about what's coming up next? Children are always excited about that, my kids, but it's things outside of school. Where do we introduce, oh, next week we're going to do this, or next term, or next month? Where do they get that real sense of looking forward to things? You know, if, you, if you're planning a party, the planning and the preparation of things is more exciting. The party's quite often a letdown, isn't it? But it's that excitement. Where do we generate that for our children? And then the final one there is curiosity. It's this, I think, we, we, get, we get wrong. So, somehow, very young children are naturally curious, aren't they? Any of you who've had young children or worked with very young children, they ask hundreds of questions a day. 
They're constantly curious about life and what happens if this and if I poke that and if I push this in the plug socket and you know, if I put the hamster in the liquidizer, what would happen? All those kind of things. They're really curious. And then they get to school and that sense of wonder and that curiosity seems to disappear quite quickly. They stop being divergent. They start becoming much more convergent thinkers. And they get to a point where answering questions becomes more important than asking them. And getting the right answer and playing that game stops them thinking. And actually, they get to a point, I meet a number of children, who they're terrified of asking questions because that shows they don't understand or that they might not be sure and they don't want to show themselves as weak like that. And I, and I think that's really wrong. So by the time they leave, they're thinking in a very divergent thing to the point that my kids, with all the technology around them, will go on Wikipedia and tell me that it's a fact. They don't ask, they don't question that, they've just learned that there's one right answer to things and you've just, that's your job to find it. I really think boosting that curiosity is one of the key things in classrooms. I just want you to have a look at this, just to test this. Okay, just with the people next to you, see how many you can remember. <clears throat> I know, I know. <clears throat> Okay, so we just have a show of hands. Uh, put your hands up if you had chocolate. Hands up if you had chocolate? Yes, very good. Put your hands up if you had sour. Yes. Well then. Put your hands up if you had sweet. No. Sweet's not there. So we are a bunch of educationalists. and We're doing a memory task, which is quite difficult. And you're making up extra words. It's not helpful. It's not good. I'm going to put it back on because there will be people here saying, it was there. <laughs> I could draw you a picture. I'd tell you, top right hand corner. I will show you. So, it's not there. The reason for showing you that is, and this is why focusing on the positive is so important, that we also, as well as having a negativity bias to our brain, our brain is, it, it makes connections. It's an organ that just makes connections between things. That's a bit like that, bit like that, bit like that. So all you did was, because of the nature of those words, you created a memory. Yeah. You actually created a memory. Sweet must have been there. I remember it. Da -da -da. What happens with this connection is our past and our future, our memories and our hopes for the future are very much determined by the mood we're in at the moment. So if we're feeling quite anxious, then, then we can't remember times we've succeeded uh, and the future will be hopeless. My, my wife, um, if I'm having an argument with my wife, okay, and she's angry with me, okay, I don't mean this is a slur term, my wife's Spanish. She's very good at anger. She's kind of, <laughs> I don't know whether it's a natural trait, Latin, but she's very good. In fact, her life is blighted by anger. Mostly directed at me, to be honest, but that's... But when we're angry, if we're having an argument, she can remember every time I've done something wrong. Yeah? And what about that time? And you, that, what she cannot physiologically do, she cannot access all the happy, good times we've had. She can't, in the middle of an argument that we're having, say, but then again, I remember a few weeks ago you were very kind to me, so let's just move on from this. <laughs> she can't actually do it. And the future becomes hopeless. That's why generating a positive emotion at the time, whether it be curiosity or gratitude or anything, allows you to access the things you've succeeded at in the past, the times you were good, times you were successful, times you were helpful, times you felt competent, and your future becomes, I'll have a go at that, I can take a risk, I can have resilience. So generating isn't just, isn't this nice, positive thing, it's, it's an absolutely vital thing. However, oh, I'll just show you this video about <laughs> curiosity, I love this, I came across this. Curiosity, wonder, humor, learning. And one more show of his backside just for everyone. Okay, so we've talked about, talked about the, the, the positive emotion. However, there's the emotion side, there's feeling good, but probably more importantly for us in terms of learning and in terms of well-being are the next four, which are all about doing well. So feeling good is one thing. I think sometimes we've gone too far 
certainly in this country, and in others that I've come across, in, in just trying to boost children's self-esteem artificially by telling them they're wonderful all the time, withdrawing challenge, not having them have to overcome difficulties. It's kind of false self-esteem. Look in a mirror and say, I love me 20 times a day and everything will be fine. And it's not, it, 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 unfortunately, what we do is set children up then to be anxious, etc. Engagement in terms of this means being fully focused on some activity, being absorbed in it to the point that you're not thinking about other else, your mind's not wandering. Time disappears. The concept of flow, Cheek Semi Heist thing, flow, which was what he, he first studied artists and found where they were so into their work sometimes they forgot to eat and sleep until it was finished. They were just immersed in it. Do you recognise that in your life? Sometimes it's sports, sometimes it's art, sometimes it's music. It's always, it's always an activity. I had a young uh, boy, uh, an 11-year-old, who's very severely uh, in this country, dyslexic, really struggled with his uh, reading and his literacy. And he'd had a bad time in school, but in his last year in primary school, he was doing really, really well. And when I spoke to him about it, what he, his answer, what he said to me, he said, ah, oh. no, he said, but sometimes I'm so into my work, I forget the time dyslexic. What he meant was, I'm so involved in it, I forget that I'm not supposed to be able to do it. Right. Does, that, does that kind of make sense? Where is Joanne here? Ah, at the bay. When I was, I was talking to, when I was in uh, Sao Paulo, I was talking to Joanne's son, and he was telling me about his interests in life, and, and I talked about flow, and his was robotics, wasn't it? So when he's doing his robotics, the rest of the world just doesn't exist. You are just constantly, it's the, it's the height of kind of uh, learning. It's when you are at your peak. Do you recognise that in your classrooms, that, that when it's in flow? Yeah, it's when, it's when the bell goes and, and the, for the end of the lesson and the children moan, go, oh. Does that happen a lot? <laughs> yeah, it, often it's creative activities, it's active things, but the, the key for it, here's the uh, criteria for, to, to get into flow. And the research would say we should be developing flow-friendly environments, environments that lead to engagement, are those that meet those criteria, but the number one is it's challenging. I think it's really vital that we understand that. Not too challenging that it's scary or stressful, but just at their area where, where they're at. But if it's not challenging, then you don't grow. And there's something about that, that overcoming that challenge that wants you to take on another one. Yeah? If you climb a mountain and you do it well, then you want to climb a higher one. Yeah? If you play a really difficult piece of music, then you want to challenge yourself with the next one. There's something about the effort and things and overcoming it that wants you to take it on to the next thing. If we withdraw effort and we um, uh, withdraw challenge and we sanitize it a little bit too much, then we deny the children the right to grow and learn uh, problem solving and, and emotional coping. So we have to be really aware of overprotection. We have to be really aware of doing this. We do our kids a disservice. I'm not saying make things so difficult. I heard a lovely phrase, which what we should, our children should be stretched, not stressed. Mm. Should just be stretching them. Where's their stress zone? How do we, how do we find that? And I understand that learning is often frustrating. It's supposed to, we're supposed to get things wrong. I think they get terrified of making mistakes. I think some of our children get terrified of making mistakes. I don't know whether you would agree. I sit in classrooms where they don't want to risk it. Yeah? My favourite story that illustrates this is for years ago was in a, a school near where I live, in, uh, uh, near Liverpool, and it was a Catholic school, and the priest had come in to speak to year three children, so they're seven years old, and he had them all in a hallway, in the, in the big hall, and he said to them, children, tell me what I'm thinking about. It's small, it's got a bushy tail, it eats nuts, and it lives up a tree. Does everyone know what that is? Yeah, yeah. So that's what he said. And, and he thought everyone would be going, ooh, and all the children went, mm. <laughs> And he thought, I don't understand this. It's small, it's got a bushy tail, it eats nuts, and it lives up trees. And again, all the children put that, and one kid put his hand up like that. And he says, well, it sounds like a squirrel, but I think the answer is Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I would highly recommend, for those people who uh, haven't come across it, uh, the uh, Mindsets with uh, Carol Dweck, the book around developing growth and fixed mindsets, whether you believe uh, your learning is due to ability or due to effort. Anyone here who can't draw? Okay, these are, these are images uh, uh, before and after self-portraits of people who couldn't draw. Um, they're self-portraits. How much teaching do you think they had? What length of time to go from the left to the right do you think these people had? They're all adults who said they couldn't draw. How long, over what time period do you think? 
A day? Ooh. <laughs> people used to, you know, people used to say a year. Five hours. Just five hours of teaching. Because what they found was they hadn't been taught how to look. They decided very early on that they just weren't any good. They were no good at drawing, so they avoided it. And they'd never learned. Because the key thing that we know is that these are the ingredients of being successful. The number one thing, the number one thing is not talent or ability. The number one thing is determined practice. No exceptions, but our children think it's ability and talent. You're either good at something or not. You're good at maths or you're not. You're good at sport or you're not. You're good at art or you're not. You're good at language or you're not. Because what the research is really clear is it's about practice. And everyone, of course people are different in their level of ability, but with the right practice, I can improve at pretty much anything. And rather than ability and talent, it's passion that drives it. So setting things up where we do that and helping our young people know that the brain is a muscle, that we grow our learning. Things are supposed to be hard. I have my son, he struggles to do anything if he can't be really good at it straight away. And so he won't expose himself in case he gets it wrong. Does anyone else have that with the, some of the young children? If it's challenging, I'm not going to do it in case, in case I can't do it straight away. And I'm always saying, you're not supposed to be able to. It's about, it's about learning how to do that. Making sure that we praise for effort and for determination. Sometimes we say, you're very clever, you've done very well, aren't you great? Which actually just builds this fixed mindset. Because if getting something right means you're clever, you can't afford to take on a challenging task. Because if you get it wrong, you're not clever anymore. So you will avoid doing that. Most of us do things like that in our life. I don't know if people see this. One of the things about engagement as well, talking about negative emotion, is being focused on something else stops you with all those worries, stops those things going around. So when I'm playing football, I don't think about my family or my work or any of my emails that I haven't answered. I'm just focused on that. And sometimes distraction for a negative emotion is one of the best things. So I'll just show you this. I came across this the other day. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Okay. The R stands for relationships. Fundamental thing uh, in terms of our well-being, in terms of our success in life. We are, as human beings, ultra-social species. We're designed to be in groups, to be interdependent, not independent, but to work together in groups. We perform better as adults and children if we're in social networks that provide support and trust, etc. The research around well-being, the single most common finding around the world, regardless of any circumstances, those people who prioritise relationships above all else is the most important thing which we kind of know, it kind of makes sense to us, doesn't it? It's been referred to in almost every uh, talk where we've been today, everyone I've heard, whether it was about technology or professionalism or anything, someone at the end said about feeling belonging and feeling you're part of something. I love this concept of an emotional bank account, whereas if we want kids to give us something, we have to deposit. In terms of positive to negative, it's really important to get that balance around positives right. Some research would suggest to have a thriving relationship with, from an adult to a child. You need five positives per one negative. Five to one. And that's because the one counts for even more. It's toxic, isn't it? Yes. Lots of people can say nice things to us. Someone who insults us, we remember that not just for days or weeks, but years mm -hmm. later. It stays with us. Does that, does that resonate with people? Yeah. Yes. Now my children are teenagers. When they were uh, younger, mine and my wife's time was at half past eight at night or whatever, the children would go to bed. And then it was, it was oh, it's our time. The children have gone to bed. Now they're teenagers. So they generally, they're up and, and they say to us things like, well, I'll say to them, can you turn the light off when you come to bed? Because I'm going to bed and I'm too tired. But we've discovered that Saturday mornings and Sunday mornings are our time. Because as teenagers, they don't get out of bed till about lunchtime. Is that, is that the same culturally everywhere? So it was the other Saturday, me and my wife were in the kitchen. I put, we're having bacon and cheese croissants. I had some soul, sweet soul music playing on the radio. We were getting on quite well. And then my daughter came in. 
she went to a cupboard. She had a little bit of an altercation with my wife, because they're not getting on at the moment. Nothing to do with me, <laughs> just then. And as my daughter walked out, as she walked out, she just looked at me and went, mm. OK? We have mirror neurons. You know, so if someone smiles at you, you must smile back. So my daughter went, mm. this is all I did. I just went, mm. okay? <laughs> nothing more. Mm. You can forget your flirting, your sweet soul, your things. Mm -hmm. Why did you always take her side? And I was like, I, 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 I didn't do anything. That, everything, all the good stuff is gone. It's the same in the classroom. Yeah. Oh, wow, I've been nice to them, I've done all this, and now they've, they've, you know, they're, 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 they're not working for me, they're not motivated. It's because those one things, they're toxic. It's one of the hardest things, I think, to keep that relationship with children, especially if they might be challenging around motivation. And it's about those things. It's about paying attention to detail and treating them as individuals. My uh, nephew said, Uncle Simon, when he was 10, Uncle Simon, when you were at school, did you ever have a teacher who, when they were with other grown-ups, was nice, but when the other grown-ups weren't there, was horrible? That's what he said. And this is what his teacher did. He was doing a painting, he was doing a painting to go up on the display. And when he finished it, he said to his teacher, can I, can I put this up on the display? He said, it's not good enough. It's not good enough to go on a wall. So he's quite resilient, is Lewis. So he said, well, if it's not good enough, can I take it home for Nana? My Nana, she'll put it on the wall. It's so nice, isn't it? And his teacher said, there's only one place that's going. And she picked it up and she ripped it. She could have had the best techniques, the best curriculum, the best everything in the world, but he did nothing for her from that point. Because it was all about their relationship. And perhaps, the area where it causes the most problem is in terms of behaviour management. And a book that we're using quite a lot, uh, or a concept, uh, is this idea of the chimp. I don't know whether people have come across this, that we have a human brain and a chimp brain. Human bra uh, brain is our logical, thoughtful one, and the chimp brain is our, is our uh, quick brain. It's the one that just uh, picks up ideas and jumps to conclusions and does things. And often, within the classroom, with the dynamic of that, especially around children who might be going <laughs> moaning and things, then we react like that. We sometimes blame them or accuse them, don't we? We call them names, sometimes. I met a little boy five years old. I said, hello, I'm Simon. He said, hello, I'm Naughty Elliot. <laughs> Not I'm Elliot, he's sometimes naughty. I walked into a class once. I was going to do a presentation to some of the children. This is how the teacher introduced me. He said, some of you are lazy. Some of you are just stupid. He said, but if you just concentrate and listen to Mr. Ward, you might learn something. A great introduction. <laughs> yeah? It's about recognising those things. It's about learning uh, as teachers and helping young people to learn to have a mental pause button to stop that first reaction in terms of relationships. You know that when we, that when we say things that we regret to yeah. children? Lots of things will come out. I work a lot with newly qualified teachers and, and when they're doing their teaching practice, the thing they find hardest is when they go into someone else's class and, and their kids, someone will have earphones in or something and they'll say, you have to take those out and they go, Mr. Soames lets us wear these. <laughs> you know that kind of thing? And their reaction is, do I look like Mr. Soames? <laughs> do I look? Instead of, well, you know, perhaps he does and I need you to put them away and I'll check with him later. It's about having scripts, it's about that professionalism was talked about yesterday, it's about understanding your own reactions to children and keeping those relationships going. These have nothing to do with this, these are my favourite slides ever. There was just some young children asked, because the most important relationship is marriage and relationships from, the, from lots of the children. Uh, these children just asked, how do mum and dad get together? <laughs> Which I quite like, you just lie. Yeah. Uh, how can you tell if somebody's married? This will be romance and things. That's the definition of marriage. <laughs> but my favourite one of all, <laughs> what's the, this is Ricky. I don't know how Ricky's going to do in life, academically, but he will be successful with the ladies. <laughs> what's the secret of a successful marriage? This is Ricky. <laughs> okay, this is the one, uh, uh, the M for perma is meaning and purpose. Absolute drive for humans. It's been mentioned by a number of people again today. We, 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 we seem to have a need to find a goal bigger than us, to have something that's personally relevant and meaning. But from a very young age, 
young people and children want to be helpful, want to feel they're contributing, want to know where they fit in, where they're valued. This was uh, uh, some research that's done, but you, you can see the full thing. These children don't know the, uh, the men. Oh. Hmm. Oh. This is my favorite. Oh. natural thing. So where do we find, where do we give kids that, that voice, that sense of hoping, that part of I'm valued for myself? Uh, and where do we get that from as, as people working in education? When I was in uh, uh, Brazil a few weeks ago, I was in Sao Paulo, and uh, uh, they have a tradition there on their teacher days, on their uh, Cambridge days, which is brilliant, where people bring in non-perishable goods, food, mm -hmm. that gets given to a charity. Okay? And instead of someone presenting it, there was a video of the charity. And this was a school, uh, or a, a, an institution that provided activities in a school-based environment for children outside of school, when they had perhaps no one at home, and they might be running on the streets or with gangs or whatever. I couldn't really follow it because it was in Portuguese, but I could see it. It was starring one young man, and it showed the distance he had to go back home, and his mum couldn't be there because she needed to work, etc. And then it showed him using this facility, which was fantastic. It was just brilliant. And it showed a very inspirational member of staff there who was helping the young people sing in a choir. Beautiful. And they were singing, and all on the video, the screen, these children were singing, they were full of joy, they were full of happiness, and everyone was really enjoying it. And then the screen went up, and the children were actually on the stage behind the screen. So there were 650 teachers in this room. At that moment, when those children were on the stage, Every single person in the audience spontaneously stood up, started applauding, they were crying, they were, they were just full of emotion. Then the young boy who was there, he started crying, then his mother came on and they were hugging on the stage. But what, what struck me was, there was this joint feeling and what struck me was, every single teacher in that room was watching that and of course it was moving of itself but you could see and everyone I spoke to afterwards, they realized that what they did made a difference for children's lives. That what they did was vital on an individual level. That they had an opportunity to interact with children on a daily basis that had a profound impact. That's a sense of meaning and purpose. That's a driving thing. That becomes absolutely vital. And it's about, and I think we heard a lot about autonomy this morning, and agency. And, and, and of course that's vital for meaning and purpose. I think we do it very well in terms of choice, but a lot of people talk about autonomy in just terms of choice. They talk about organizational autonomy, what group I'm in, what's the due date for my work, what are the rules. Procedural autonomy, having a choice about the medium you use, whether we're using PowerPoint or whether we're doing it. And that's all well and good, but the most powerful one, the thing that's the most important is cognitive autonomy. And what that means is having a sense that you're contributing to having a sense that you have a say in the development of your curriculum or your projects. It means feeling that your voice is heard. And it particularly means finding something salient that links into your life. How do we, how do we engage it? Well, you, you find something that gives the children autonomy, a reason for doing something. Does that, does that make sense? When we, again, sorry, I'm talking about Sao Paulo, but I had such a great experience there. When we went... Joanne took us to a restaurant after the, after the day. And we went out for a nice restaurant. It was his favorite pizza restaurant. And then his son came to join us, the son who's into robotics. He came to join us there, didn't he? What a beautiful, mature, intelligent, 
young man talking away about his interests and what he was going to do in his future. But then Joan said to me, um, oh, I was trying for ages to get him to talk English, to take it seriously, and he wasn't interested. Couldn't get him to learn English at all. This is what I knew that he loved to come here and eat pizza. And I said to him, oh, I have people coming from all over the world to come to Brazil to see our facilities and do all this. He said, this is where I'm going to bring them. He said, they won't speak Portuguese, so we have to speak English. If you want to come here and eat pizza, you'll have to learn how to speak English. And he said from that, he said, was like, I'm learning to speak English. <laughs> and he was absolutely fluent. Sometimes it doesn't have to be big things, does it? Just find what links in. How do we link into them? Um, I'm aware of the time, so I'm just going to think so. A big thing, find and build their strengths and passions. Find at least one passion. Find their strengths. Find their interests and utilize them and use them. Oh, I just want to show you this. It's really important. I love this slide because it tells us the importance of finding your passions and interests and finding your tribe. Whether it be through music, whether it be through sport, all of us seek to find where we belong, don't we? And it's important that our children are given opportunities to do that. This is uh, Liverpool, and this is Michael Owen missing a goal. So he's gone like that. All his teammates have gone like that. All the crowd have gone like that. Nobody stood at the start and said, right, if Michael Owen misses a goal, I want you all to go like that. <laughs> it's a sense of community. It's a sense of our tribe, apart from the man in the yellow. <laughs> He's in a completely different tribe. But it's through our passions and our interests, whether that be music or art or whatever that we do. We should find and fuel at least one passion. Every time you teach a group of kids, every one of those child children is better than you at something. How do we find that? How do we, how, do we, how do we bring that out? I think it's really vital. I'm just going to move on to the final one, which is accomplishments. Having a sense of accomplishment. We can have our goals, we can have our engagement, but what we have to have is this sense that we are moving forward. We have to have a sense that we can be competent. The three, the three uh, things that we need for intrinsic motivation are a sense of connectedness and relatedness to people, a sense of autonomy, and a sense of competence. Self-determination theory, Deci and Ryan, been around for over 30 years, incredibly well studied. How do we generate that motivation? We don't do it with external things, we generate it from inside. We create conditions that allow children to be motivated. And it's about setting mastery goals, not performance goals. And by that I mean it's not about how fast you do something or the grade you get, it's about am I improving? It's about hundreds of small successes. If you want children to write a book, start with a page. Yeah, this was just me after I'd uh, accomplished my very first black run skiing. I've only been skiing for a few years, and the first time I went, black runs like that. Do you know if anyone's ever been on those? And what happened was my friends, who were all expert skiers, took me in my first week skiing down this little route, and then we came to a cliff. And I said, where's the way down? And they said, that's the way down. And they all skied off down this cliff. And I just sat and cried. And then I got down, it took me two and a half hours. I did it on my backside, couldn't ski at all. This was me after four years, the first time I skied it. At no time, at no time in the intervening every time I went, did I think, am I skiing faster than them? Didn't care at all. All I cared about was, am I improving? Am I improving? I've no interest in being the best skier. I've no interest in comparing myself to other people. I just want to improve. There's a natural engine in us to grow. A natural thing that, that we need to grow. These are some boys that we, we took out on a, on a well-being project, fishing. Here's the first one, very proud of his accomplishments. Here's the second one. He's also very proud of his accomplishments. <laughs> it's about, yeah, does that make sense? So a lot of our children, they're perfectionists, they compare. If I'm not doing as well as them, then I don't want to do it. That's not what we should be about. We should be allowing everyone to develop. Develop that self-control. To be able to set a target and, and, and rein in your impulses. This morning, someone talked about moral purpose. I think we've all got a moral purpose, and I think that moral purpose is everyone who goes into education does it to make a difference. We do it to make a difference to children. What keeps us there, what keeps us there is seeing children flourish and thrive and overcome things and grow. And those little moments that suddenly show us that they've got something or they introduce something to us. And uh, I was reminded when I was in Rio, sorry I'm overrunning, and I'll be two minutes. I was in Rio, the Olympics about to be there. In England, we have a, a, a rower called Steve Redgrave, and he's won five gold medals most successful Olympian we've ever had in Great Britain. After his fourth gold medal, 
He was absolutely exhausted. He was getting out of the boat and a TV crew came to him. And I don't know if anyone saw this or remembers. And what he said to them was, they asked him how he felt. He said, if anyone sees me, he said, I'm finished, I'm finished. If anyone sees me going anywhere near a boat again, they have my permission to shoot me. <laughs> All right, that's what he said. Don't let me do it again. But of course he came back four years later and went, I meet teachers every Friday afternoon like that. They're drained, they've given everything, and they say, Don't, if anyone sees me near a school again on Monday, they have my permission to shoot me. But they turn up again on that Monday mm -hmm. because they have a moral purpose, which is to do something more than just prepare children for academic success. It's about helping children grow and helping be the best they can be. And we do that by creating the right environment. This is a picture of Death Valley. Nothing grows in Death Valley, yeah? yeah? Except human beings seem to have a biological imperative to grow and develop and learn. It's in us from a tiny age until we die. We want to learn, want to do it, but only if the conditions are right. Only if we're in a situation when the environment supports us making mistakes and finding our strengths and developing perseverance. So nothing grows in Death Valley unless every so often, and this year is one of those years, Conditions are just right that everything flourishes. This is Death Valley this year. Because conditions have changed. Our job in education is to provide those conditions, provide that environment, both in terms of relationships and the, and the experiences that we give children, that do more than just prepare them for the, a life of tests, but prepare them for the tests of life. It's about helping children flourish. Sorry I've overrun by a few minutes. I hope that was useful. Thank you very much. <laughs>